six people are confirmed dead and scores of others injured or missing as a massive fire engulfs a London high-rise. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions denies any collusion with Russia to sway last year's presidential elections. And a U.S. congressman tells South Sudan's President Salva Kiir, enough is enough with the man-made conflict. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Now, a massive fire at a high-rise apartment building has killed at least 12 people in the British capital on Wednesday. That's according to London's Metropolitan Police. The towering inferno totally engulfed and destroyed the huge structure. A number of patients are being treated at uh, area hospital stands, uh, stands at 74, including 20 people in critical care. Authorities say the number of casualties is likely to rise. More than 200 firefighters and 40 fire engines responded to the blaze at the 24-story Grandfell Tower in London's North Kensington area, Kensington area. The blaze broke out at around 1 a.m. local time. They found the building engulfed in flames from the second floor up. Eyewitnesses say people were heard frantically screaming for help from the burning tower and spotted at windows trying to attract the attention of rescue crews. One resident described the chaotic situation inside the building. Um, yeah, there was smoke everywhere, literally everywhere. There was, there was people downstairs, there was bits of the block, um, cladding falling off the block. That was on fire. People screaming. People screaming. Um, after a couple of minutes, because obviously people were still sleeping um, on the higher floors, so they didn't have a clue what was going on. I'm not even sure if half of them got out, to be honest with you. There was kids at the window, there was people flashing their phone lights just to, for help, but the fire brigade couldn't get upstairs. Well, London Fire Commissioner Danny Carton said the cause of the fire remains unknown. The London Fire Brigade says an inspection of the burned-out building deemed it safe for crews to remain. Smoke from the burning tower could be seen billowing over the London skyline at sunrise. Now, a spokesman for the British Prime Minister, Theresa May, says she is deeply saddened by the tragic loss of life in the Grenfell Tower fire. For the latest details on this tragedy, let's uh, go to VOA Europe correspondent Luis Ramirez. Now, Luis, what more can you tell us about uh, this incident? Well, that fire, is many hours later, is still burning, and I will say that uh, talking to people out there, the uh, grief is rapidly turning to anger, and that's as big questions start to come up on not only how did this fire start, but why did it spread so quickly? Witnesses said that uh, from the moment it started to when, uh, to when it engulfed the whole building was about 30 minutes. It took uh, that little time for the fire to go through this 24-story tower. And so uh, the big questions at this moment, uh, as uh, police are telling us that the, uh, that the death toll is very likely to rise because we're talking about uh, a, a situation where, as I said, the fire is still burning and cr rescue crews are going floor by floor uh, very carefully making their way up and unfortunately discovering uh, more victims. Now, we have heard that this is a council building, as they call it in Britain, uh, public housing, essentially. Uh, and that recently, it had been kind of the management had been outsourced to a private company. Has that become an issue? There, that's one of the many questions coming up. Uh, the fact is that this building had been only re recently renovated. It was built in 1973, and uh, it was just a, couple, a year ago that it underwent a a $13 million renovation. Uh, that's one of the big areas of questioning because uh, the, the, uh, the issue is what kind of materials were used in that renovation. A lot of the uh, residents who managed to escape uh, reported smelling burning plastic and so uh, they are asking, uh, did some of the uh, building materials, uh, were they flammable, were they fireproof? Uh, and uh, another big question that's coming up is why did the, uh, why were there no sprinklers and in some cases if there were sprinklers, why they malfunctioned. Uh, residents also asking, saying they didn't hear fire alarms. So these are all things that are coming into play in the investigation in the coming days. Uh, the fire commissioner saying that uh, that investigation is going to take uh, quite a while and so is very careful not to draw any conclusions before then. So as for the cause, nobody is thinking perhaps is an act of terrorism or arson or whatever the case may be up to this point. 
That could be in the back of a lot of uh, people's minds uh, because, of course, uh, London has seen uh, acts of terrorism to the rate of one per month in the last three months. Uh, however, there is nothing to indicate, absolutely nothing to officially indicate that this could be uh, terrorism related. Uh, the fact is this building is, uh, is a multi-ethnic uh, community, people from all over the world living there, a very large contingent of Muslim uh, or a large uh, representation of Muslim families uh, living there along with uh, senior citizens uh, and uh, many okay. people from, from various African countries as well. A terrible tragedy. Luis, thank you very much. That's a VOA Europe correspondent, Luis Ramirez. Now, tragedy also struck in the United States Wednesday. Congressman Stephen Scalise was shot in Alexandria, Virginia, just south of Washington, while he and other Republican congressional lawmakers were practicing for an annual baseball game scheduled to be held on Thursday. Scalise is reported to be in stable condition at a Washington hospital after being shot in the hip. Four other people were wounded when the lone gunman opened fire on the early morning practice moments ago, President Donald Trump announced that the suspected shooter has died, apparently from wounds sustained in a gun battle with police. We'll hear from the president shortly, but first, let's hear from Arizona Senator Jeff Flake, who was at the scene when Scalis was shot. I hope Steve's okay. I, I did call his wife. I got his phone and called his wife uh, to make sure that when she woke up, she didn't hear news that... Uh, and let her know that I, I thought that he was certainly going to be okay. Well, a short time ago at the White House, President Donald Trump spoke about the shooting. Shortly after 7 a.m. this morning, a gunman opened fire on members of Congress and their staffs as they were practicing for tomorrow's annual charity baseball game. Authorities are continuing to investigate the crime, and the assailant has now died from his injuries. The FBI is leading the investigation and will continue to provide updates as new information becomes available. Congressman Steve Scalise, a member of House leadership, was shot and badly wounded and is now in stable condition at the hospital along with two very courageous Capitol Police officers. At least two others were also wounded. Many lives would have been lost if not for the heroic actions of the two Capitol Police officers who took down the gunman despite sustaining gunshot wounds during a very, very brutal assault. Melania and I are grateful for their heroism and praying for the swift recovery of all victims. Well, according to multiple media reports, law enforcement officials have identified the man suspected of opening fire at the Congressional Baseball Practice as 66-year-old James T. Hodgkinson from Belleville, Illinois, a suburb of St. Louis, Missouri. Now, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions has vociferously denied any collusion with Russia to sway last year's presidential election. Appearing before a Senate panel, Sessions defended President Trump's decision to fire FBI, uh, former FBI Director James Comey, but repeatedly refused to discuss any conversations involving the president. Viewers Michael Bowman has the details. America's top law enforcement officer sought to dispel the mystery surrounding meetings he had with Russia's ambassador while serving as a top campaign backer of Donald Trump, encounters he did not acknowledge during his confirmation hearing. I have never met with or had any conversation with any Russians or any foreign officials concerning any type of interference with any campaign or election in the United States. Further, I have no knowledge of any such conversations by anyone connected to the Trump campaign. The former senator pushed back hard on any suggestion that he colluded with Russia. Appalling and detestable lie. The attorney general said he recused himself from the Russia investigation to adhere with regulations, not because he did anything wrong. 
Sessions testified just days after former FBI Director James Comey made cryptic reference to additional factors that would have made Sessions' participation in the Russia probe problematic. What are they? There are none. I can tell you that for absolute certainty. Session said he concurred with the president's decision to fire Comey that a fresh start was needed at the FBI. When pressed that the Russia probe prompted Comey's dismissal, the attorney general said he would let the president speak for himself. So you'd had no verbal uh, conversation with him well, about the firing uh, of Mr. Comey? I'm not able to discuss with you or confirm or deny uh, the nature of uh, private conversations that I may have had with the president. The Democrats' today. tempers flared. You're impeding this investigation. Sessions said the president has a right to keep his conversations confidential, but acknowledged Trump has yet to invoke that right. Some Republicans came to his defense. One compared the allegation of collusion with Russia to an outlandish spy novel. Have you ever, in any of these fantastical situations, heard of a plot line <laughs> so ridiculous that a sitting United States senator and an ambassador of a foreign government colluded at an open setting with hundreds of other people to pull off the greatest caper. Democrats saw nothing to chuckle about. I'm not sure that if there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government, that it was Senator Jeff Sessions from Alabama and the Russian ambassador that were the principals. Uh, but uh, the hearing today does seem to raise you know, more questions than it answered. Media reports say Trump was enraged by Sessions' recusal from the Russia probe, something the attorney general would neither confirm nor deny. Michael Bowman, VOA News, the Capitol. Well, the influx of South Sudan refugees into Uganda has caught the attention of U.S. lawmakers who are calling for an end to the country's political conflict that has seen thousands of people lose their lives and millions more displaced. Africa 54's Esther the Ewart sat down with Congressman Chris Smith, who recently returned from Uganda's BDBD refugee camp. Congressman Chris Smith led a delegation of U.S. lawmakers to the BDBD camp in Uganda, which is now home to thousands of South Sudanese refugees. One of the things that struck me the most was how welcoming Uganda is of the refugees. Matter of fact, they made a point of saying they're not refugees, they're our brothers and sisters. In the last one month, the World Food Program slashed food rations by half, forcing some of the refugees to steal food from the local communities. There is some shortages of food. Uh, rations were cut uh, because of um, inadequate funding. The United States, for its part, is the largest donor by far. So we need to do more, in my opinion. But the European Union and others need to step up as well uh, with money for the World Food Program and for medicines and, and shelter that's being provided. Uganda is hosting over 900,000 refugees from South Sudan. And Congressman Smith says the displacement is directly linked to the conflict. The Famine that's being experienced in some areas um, is directly attributable to conflict. East African regional leaders have attempted but failed in their effort to mediate peace in South Sudan. Smith says Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, whom he met during the visit, is in the best position to talk to South Sudan's leader. I think in terms of influence, he might even have the greatest influence on Salvakir and the other nations in the, in, in, the, in the region need to step up and say to Salvakir, that's it. Peace is the only alternative now. That's it. His discussion with South Sudanese President Salva Kiir in Juba last month follows a meeting in August 2016 in which he recalls atrocities committed by Kiir soldiers who raped local and foreign humanitarian aid workers and killed a journalist. I said, you know, zero tolerance on sexual abuse, Mr. President, and you need to promulgate a rule in your military and security forces. I was very blunt. Our aid is contingent on human rights criteria, too. So did uh, President Salva Kiir take any responsibility for what is going on in his country? He didn't put it in terms of taking responsibility, but he did talk about making changes. Uh, I mentioned to him that they need a modern military that obeys the rule of law 
then the chain of command understands human rights norms uh, from top to bottom, from general to private, uh, that the abuse of civilians is absolutely actionable by prosecution uh, and a zero tolerance on all sexual harassment of every kind. South Sudan's civil war erupted in December 2013. The fighting has killed thousands of people and displaced nearly 4 million people, including 1.8 million who have sought refuge in neighboring countries. Two million are internally displaced. As to Gidu Ewart, VOA News, Washington. Well, British Prime Minister Theresa May and French President Emmanuel Macron are joining forces in order to crack down on tech companies, ensuring they set up their efforts uh, to combat terrorism online. And many uh, may travel to Paris Tuesday to hold talks on counterterrorism measures with Macron. Britain and France face similar challenges in fighting homegrown Islamist extremism and share similar scars from deadly attacks that rocked London, Manchester, Paris and Nice. We need to improve access to encrypted content in a way that the confidentiality of exchanges is respected. And in order to prevent the usage of social networks by terrorists or criminals, we need to step up international cooperation, especially in the United States, and in order to improve access to digital proofs that are used in our police and judicial investigations, wherever this data is located. Well, Prime Minister May says the campaign includes exploring the possibility of legal penalties against tech companies if they fail to take the necessary action to remove an acceptable content. Well, I want to know what you think about Africa 54, the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Facebook. The, the address is Africa 54. You're also streaming our show live on Facebook, so check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, East Africa leads the way in African business, while the continent retains its position as the second fastest growing continent globally. Stay with us. I'm Jeff Selden, and I work the National Security Beat. National Security Beat is anything that affects the national security of the United States, from counterterrorism to surveillance to even relations with Russia. It's one of the most fascinating beats you can have. It's probably one of the more important beats that you can cover because it touches on so many areas of the world, so many areas of people's day-to-day -day lives. I'm Jeff Selden, and my beat is national security. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence, a roundup of the world's top stories with analysis from our dedicated reporters. It's really a conversation the same way that you would bring a friend to your home and ask them what's going on. In our correspondence, we'll do that and answer those questions through their own eyes. That appears a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world. Well, in Wednesday's business news, East Africa is the primary driver of growth in Africa, with Ethiopia leading the way. Joining us now from New York is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino. Hello, Jill. Hi, good morning. Well, while the continent's major economies were hit by the fall in commodity prices in 2016, Africa retained its position as the second fastest growing continent globally, recording an average of 2.2% GDP growth only behind South Asia, and that's according to the African Development Bank Group. East Africa outperformed with a growth rate of 5.3%, driven by strong performance in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Djibouti. I would expect that to continue with the latest rail infrastructure in place that we've reported on. Uh, Southern Africa recorded a 1.1% average due to the poor performance of South Africa. Now, West Africa was at the bottom, averaging just about half a percent growth rate despite good performances by Coup d'Ivoire and Senegal, which were canceled out by recession and socio-political factors that bogged down the economy to about 1.5% growth. Nigeria and South Africa, they accounted for the largest share of Africa's GDP, with 29% and 19% respectively. So you could see why they're so important when you look at growth rates. Now, does the Africa Africa Development Bank expects African growth to continue. 
Well, the bank estimates that its high five priorities, light up and power Africa, feed Africa, industrialize Africa, integrate Africa, and improve the quality of life for the people of Africa, that would spearhead the continent's economic diversification and growth and broad-based economic opportunities that will shield the continent from future commodity shocks and enhance their resilience. However, the report also cited rising debt, structural weaknesses, power outages, climate change, conflicts, political instability, and terrorism among some of the downside risks which can't be ignored either. Now, how much more could the African economy improve? Well, the report said African economies would improve further to average 3.4 percent growth in 2018, followed by 4.3 percent in 2018, driven largely by growing domestic demand and good performing countries. Other factors include improved supply conditions and a good business environment, prudo macroeconomic management, favorable external financial flows, and high public spending. The report notes that while natural resources and primary commodities remain major growth drivers, their importance has declined, while domestic factors include including consumption demand, now play a greater role. Well, Jill, thank you very much as always. We look forward to your next report. Uh, that's Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting live from New York. Now, solar power is lighting up the night sky in Jordan and making life easier for the 20,000 Syrian refugees at a camp that once had no reliable source of electri electricity. Viewers Faith Lapidus reports. Azraq is the second largest Syrian refugee camp in Jordan. Since it opened more than two years ago, the camp residents have lived without reliable access to electricity. The newly inaugurated solar plant, funded by the IKEA Foundation, will change that. It means the world to refugees that obviously are here in the camp that didn't have access to electricity in a dependable way. It means uh, lighting for safety, for protection at night, uh, for some cool in terms of a fan on a hot summer's day or some heat in the winter during the cold months. Farhan Nazal says having reliable power means freedom. Before electricity, we could not come and go as we please. At sunset, we would be confined to our homes. Now that we have electricity, we can go to our neighbor's house, enjoy the evening, or our neighbors can come over. It is more enjoyable, we have fun, and are happier. And kids can watch TV, although that's not the benefit that's most important to Anas Ahmed. To begin with, students, for example, my children can now study with lights on. Secondly, it was very hot in the caravan. Now I have a fan. We also have a fridge now, so we have cool water and can preserve our food and a washing machine. I previously had to transfer water and my wife would wash clothes by hand. It's a lot easier for her now. The plant's construction has also provided work opportunities for some 50 refugees who were trained and employed to build and set up the solar panels. They now have skills to maintain and operate the plant and apply them elsewhere to find work outside the refugee camp. I'm Faith Lapidus, VOA News. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, wildlife poaching and trafficking leave some of Africa's most iconic species in danger. We'll be right back. Specifically, we've seen. <laughs> well, 
Welcome back. Now, uh, poaching and wildlife trafficking have left some of Africa's most iconic species endangered. The loss of the animals has cost African countries critical tourism revenue. One well, National Park is getting a second chance. Lee Wunde National Park in southern Malawi recently welcomed some new inhabitants. Those are four cheetahs relocated from South Africa by the non-profit African parks. Lamek Masina has our report. The rangers lured the cheetah out into its new home with a fresh carcass. This is the first cheetah Malawi has had in the world in two decades. The cheetah is the fastest land animal in the world, but even that couldn't protect the species in Malawi. Poachers killed off the cheetah's prey and ultimately the cheetahs themselves. They were last seen uh, within Malawi about 20 years ago and specifically in the Liwandi area they've been absent for over a hundred years. So as part of the rehabilitation of the park uh, we feel very um, that, that it's very important to bring back the cheetah to Malawi and Liwandi specifically. A total of four cheetahs, two males and two females were airlifted to Liwandi from South Africa in May. The cheetahs spent their first three weeks in this enclosure getting acclimated. Liwonde National Park has a population of 12,000 large mammals. These include bushbuck, water buffalo, and antelope. They cheat as the first large predator to be reintroduced to the park. We have a very healthy um, animal base, and now that the protection measures are in place, we've got very good law enforcement in the park. The numbers of animals are increasing very rapidly. And as a result of that, there is more than enough um, animals to provide for some carnivorous animals such as the cheetah. Meanwhile, the officials are holding meetings with the communities surrounding the park. Those people are likely uh, to face dangers. And our message to the communities is to say, can they refrain from entering the park and doing what they used to be doing? Because these animals, definitely, they are dangerous they can uh, kill a human being. Park officials say they soon plan to also reintroduce leopards and lions to restore the park's lost glory. Lamek Masina for VOA News, Luonde, Malawi. Well, and that's our show for today. Now be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the morning, City Break Africa, that's between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. For all of us here at VOA, good night from Washington. Good night. years ago, I moved to America and became a radio broadcaster. Since then, my life has become more colorful. I have reported on numerous news events to radio stations. My view and colleagues have become a second family. As a Muslim, life in America is just as fulfilling as life back home in Indonesia.